attending our webinar today. My name is Melissa Schwartz, and I'm the manager of the education team here at Training Peaks. I also have Sean Hygen joining me. She's also a member of the education team. Today's webinar is how to break up the winter training doldrums. And Jennifer Harrison, owner of J JHC Triathlon Coaching, is going to be leading this webinar. Um, I'm really excited about it. I know living in Colorado where there's a lot of cold days and a lot of snow, sometimes it can get really kind of boring to do boring trainer rides, you're riding inside, running on the treadmill. So we really wanted to do a webinar that goes through how to make things more exciting and how to still get outside when the weather is really bad. So um, just a couple housekeeping things to get out of the way before we start. If you have questions that you'd like Jen to answer at the end, go ahead and enter them in the question area. Um, Sean's gonna be collecting them and we're gonna have Jen answer some questions at the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Jen. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Sean. Happy to join everybody, and thanks to everybody listening. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, like Melissa said, beating the winter training doldrums. And it's, it, it's kind of this touchy topic because I think, <laughs> frankly, it depends on what you, where you are on how bad winter is and how, how aggressive we can be with some of the conditions. But just for everybody's background, I'm born and raised in Chicago, and I'm based in Chicago. So um, it is very very cold here. It's not Alaska cold, but it's still cold. Um, so I have been forced to be very creative in my coaching and in my training over the past 20 plus years so that I can get the most out of athletes. Um, so let's just kick it off and I'm going to go over a general thing about winter training and some of the mental part about winter training and then I'm going to go into the full-blown um, some of the specifics into bike, swim, run, strength, and all that other good stuff. Um, so first, athletes, you know, you guys can really gain a lot of different things when you mix it up over the winter and experiment with new things. One of the things that I really, really encourage my athletes to do is to take some risks and do some new things. With a lot of the folks that I coach in the northern Midwest, um, a lot of them uh, skate, ski, cross-country ski, and do all of that in the winter. And I really think the winter is a great time to experiment with that. Downhill skiing, I mean, downhill skiing doesn't really have a lot of applicable um, benefits to, you know, obviously Ironman training and stuff. But I'm really a fan of, of doing things like that. Um, and I'm also a fan of, of, of getting outside. Um, and, you know, there's really never, ever inappropriate weather. It's just inappropriate gear. Um, bundle up. People ask me all the time in emails and phone calls, Jen, what's cold? What do you consider cold? And I was like, oh, that's a really tough question because in my mind there is no such thing as too cold. Um, the only time that I would bring in an indoor workout running-wise is if we don't have traction, it's completely a sheet of ice outside. Um, that's purely a safety issue. But as far as, uh, as getting outside, I don't really think that there is um, a temperature gauge in the lower 48 states here. And if you're living overseas or you're living somewhere that's much colder, Alaska or something like that, then obviously there's, there's some safety issues when we get below zero and into the negative wind chills. Um, but some of the options that we have, too, with the winter is, you know, I, I really, really – really believe that we can get so much out of our winter training and like I said we're going to go over the swim bike run specifics and stuff but you know don't forget triathlon is really an, an aerobic it's an aerobic event it's an aerobic um, Olympic distance racing is all aerobic so really capitalize on that this winter whether you're mountain biking whether you're cross-country skiing keep it aerobic and just get outside. You don't need to be pushing intervals. You don't need to be on your time trial bike in aero position in January outside for most of us who are not racing until later in the season. So really take advantage of being able to utilize your aerobic system. Um, one of the things that I think is, is a way to break up your winter, and I do it all the time, is to schedule a winter escape. Um, I have the luxury of having a place, a little place in Tucson where I run a lot of my triathlon camps out of in the spring. And um, my husband and I or some friends and I go once a month down there. And I do that 
um, just to get out of the monotony of the Chicago gray days. And um, sometimes it's not a financial, um, you know, people financially can't do it, but if you can do it and you have friends or you can make it go on the cheap and do it, then get out and do something like that because you definitely, definitely will help kind of break up the, the little bit of the, the, the doldrums. Um, the other thing, too, that I think is really, really important and something to think about is, um, you know, maximize the time that you're inside and really work on some mental toughness stuff. I think one of the things that we're able to do in the winter is really, really focus on the specifics of the workouts. And we're able to, to have a very specific time in a specific setting, in the basement, on the treadmill, in the dark, cold pool. We're able to focus and work on the specifics of the workouts. Um, and I think that sometimes in the summertime or when we're outside all the time and we're out there socializing and we're out there with our friends and we're out there with everybody else, we really have a hard time focusing on, on some of this. So I really am a, I'm a big fan of being able to focus and really, really, really kind of nail down, nail down the workout. Um, the other thing, too, as I think it's, it's fun and different in the wintertime, is you really can have get some friends involved. Sometimes, um, if any of you guys that are listening have compu trainers, and compu trainers are a phenomenal tool. Um, it's a bike trainer that's hooked up to your computer that runs uh, computer-generated programs, and it's controlled by... Um, you know, watts, you can manage your watts on there, your heart rate. There are uh, courses on there in 3D it's a, by a company called RacerMate. And it's a phenomenal tool. And you can actually get on there and ride these compu trainers, and you can do virtual racing with your friends. And sometimes you can set up the courses. You know, you can do that every weekend. You can ride the course. You can ride um, and race your friends and do the same course for several weeks and have everybody do that and race each other. And it is actually, a, really, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions about that, let us know. But it's, it gets a little complicated in the beginning to set up, but then it's something that you can really kind of have a lot of fun with. Um, the other thing, too, is I always tell people, um, it's a great time, obviously, to catch up on movies, catch up on TV, as long as you, back to my point of having the focus, having the structure in your workout, and then you can watch TV and catch up on movies and, and listen to podcasts and listen to um, things like these webinars. This is a great time. Um, I listen to a lot of my podcasts when I'm on the bike. As long as the bike is not an, a hard bike, I can do that, and it kind of kills two birds with one stone as long as I can multitask appropriately. Um, I think it's a great tool to get our minds off of, of things. Um, the other thing, too, that I really like about the indoor training in the wintertime um, that's an excellent time to work on your nutrition. Um, I think that one of the things I struggle with as a coach in this time of the year is getting people to carry fluids and nutrition in their training. And because they're like, well, Jen, I'm only out going out running for an hour and it's 20 degrees outside. I'm not sweating. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. We are so kind of mentally, it's, it's this urban myth that once it's cold out, we don't need to eat and drink as much. And it's not true at all. At all. Our body, bodies work so hard trying to stay warm, trying to produce the warmth in order, to, in order to move us forward in the running and the cycling and everything else that we really need to, to eat appropriately. So when we're inside, use your kitchen, use your nutrition. Um, bring down the gels and bring down the, the drinks and, and really, really focus on that. Um, you know, the other thing, too, I want to I reiterate, too, before we get into the specifics of each sport is make sure one of my things for 2013, not only as an athlete but as a coach and trying to reiterate this to athletes, is be present for every one of your workouts. And in the winter environment, I believe we can control this much better. Um, again, we're not outside, we're not in a group ride, we're not doing that stuff when we're living in cold environments. It's so important right now with the inventions of the smartphones, the iPads, the e-readers. You know what? Just stop. I do not ever carry my phone in the basement or any kind of, you know, computer system 
because like most of you, my, that phone would be ringing all the time. Now, of course, aside from the kids situation that all of us have to you know, manage and make sure that our kids are safe, apart from that, there should be no reason that we're carrying these smartphones down in the basement and toggling through Facebook when we're on our bikes, when we should be training. Um, and so just really keep that in mind. Be present. If you take one thing away from this, this um, uh, webinar, take that away. Be present in your winter workouts. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that I'm a big believer in the winter, I'm a believer in it all year round, but something to think about and something that I encourage my athletes to do is every Sunday um, or at the end of your work week, whatever, or week, I should say, whatever that is, find, you know, 15 or 20 minutes on a quiet Sunday night, sit down in your basement, sit down in your bedroom, somewhere away from your family, your kids, um, and lock the, shut the door and lock the door. I used to tell my, my, my athletes, some of my elite athletes, to sit in a locked, in a locked room in pitch dark, but we won't go that far. But sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a room by yourself and really focus. We don't need to go as far as meditating probably, but really focus on what you accomplished during the week and what you're hoping to accomplish the following week. Sit in that pure silence and really focus on it. You know, I'm a big believer in one's personal character and that personal character being a factor in one's achievement and one's success. And if you can do one thing each week to be that better person and that better athlete, you know, what would it be? And at this time of the year, frankly, it's about sleeping right. It's about eat clean, uh, cleaning up your diet and, um, you know, getting on a, on a routine. Uh, some of you are listening that are not on a, we're not on a current routine because of the holidays or got sick. Um, this is the time to do that. Um, and it sounds trite, but really, trust me, if you do it, and I don't mean five minutes when you're driving the kids to soccer practice on a Sunday morning. It doesn't count because we're multitasking. You need to devote this time just to yourself and to, um, to, your, to your focused plan for the year. Um, so those are some of the things that overview that I wanted to talk about on the winter, and I'll leave you with this for the winter, and then we'll talk. We'll jump right into the bike. I always say this to folks, and I do believe this, and I'm sure many of you have read this if you're if you've been doing triathlons for a long time or or sports for a long time. But cha the champions are really made in the winter. I really am a fan of the athletes that come out of the winter, the strongest, with the best base foundation. Uh, the best strength and conditioning and not injured are really the ones that are going to have this awesome platform to, to jump off of. And that's what I tell my athletes. I'm like, please follow the plan unless obviously you're sick and all this other stuff that we can work around because then I know that after this base cycle, I can take these athletes to that next, that next cycle, which goes into the build cycle into the, all the other cycles that we get into as, as we prepare for the Ironman and, half Ironman or Olympic distance racing, whatever you guys are going to be doing. So let's move right on to the bike. Um, I'm going to go through this, and these are the questions you guys can ask, uh, and I'll be happy to address later. But one of the things with the bike is, you know, mix up some of the things. Here's a list of some of the, um, some of the thinking outside the box and some of the things. I talked a little bit about the CompuTrainer classes. Um, you know what, I'm not quite sure where everybody lives, but – I know that in most of the United States, um, cold states, you guys can find copy trainer classes. And you can, these are classes that are run by a coach or by, you know, a, usually a bike store. And they have a training bank of copy trainers, 8, 10, 12. You guys could ride uh, um, courses off there, uh, create, there's workouts that are created on there. And these are all based off of power, heart rate. And you can race your friends, and it's just a, it's a wonderful um, tool, and it's a social environment. We have a ton of them out here. Um, I used to teach a lot of them. I really like them. And the copy trainer is tricky, and it's a little bit complicated. So to have an environment where you can go and not think and just ride your bike, you know, I, I encourage that. Um, the other thing too is that I'm a fan of is mountain biking and cross biking, cross riding. Um, when I say cross bike, you know, there's TT bikes, road bikes, mountain bikes, cross bikes, and also uh, I talk a little bit later about fike, fixed gear. Cycle cross bikes are what I call an in-between bike between mountain bike and road road bikes. Um, they have thicker tires, and they're they're extremely durable, um, and you can ride them in the cross of the weather. So here in Chicago, we have a rare 
45 degree day, which I think everybody's out in bathing suits and shorts today here in Chicago. But um, and this is a day we'd be out on our cross bikes if we were outside because the, 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 gr the ground and the, everything is gross and wet. But we can just do all of our aerobic riding on those cross bikes instead of sitting down in the basement for two hours spinning, you know, to to some keeping up with the Kardashians or something. So I always encourage it if you can get outside and do all your aerobic, all your base riding outside, do it. Um, the other thing with the mountain biking and cross bikes is they're very, as you know, very heavy. So I'm a huge fan of doing a lot of strength, big ring work, as well as hill repeats and hill climbing in those mountain bikes. One year I got some harebrained idea. I was bored out of my mind in January, and I said to my husband, let's go up and ride the Ironman Wisconsin bike on our cross bikes. And he looked at me and he goes, okay, okay, you know that that's going to be that's going to be tough. I'm like, how tough is it going to be? I mean, seriously. Okay, so there we were in January in Madison. Now, the ground was relatively safe or else we wouldn't have done it, meaning it was somewhat plowed. But we rode our cross bikes for one loop of that Ironman Madison course. And if anybody's listening that did Iron, has done Ironman Madison, you guys can just imagine us doing those on heavy bikes in January when we're really not in that great of shape. It nearly killed us. And it took us for, I was thinking we were going to ride the whole course or the two loops, which is about 80 miles. I got done with one loop and I said to my husband, oh my God, I don't, I bet it was so hard. We were trashed and exhausted. Um, and, you know, we're experienced, I used to race cross, so we're experienced cross riders. So anyway, it was hilarious. But that is something that is thinking outside of the box, that's challenging, that's fun, and really can mix up your your training um moving on to to rollers um if anybody um has never been on rollers you should really give it a try um i have scars all over my left knee from rollers back in the day when my husband used to ride them all the time in our basement we had one of those basements in chicago it wasn't you know concrete walls so i'm on the rollers one day and most people that are really good at rollers can multitask and do things on the rollers, whereas I was holding on for dear life. And you really almost have to ride them when you start in between doorway so you have somewhere to go to if you're going to fall. And I was on the, the rollers, and I flew off the rollers and rode, who knows what speed, off into the, um, to the sidewall and just ripped up my, my body. And um, that was a great lesson of I really needed to focus on my smoothing out my pedal stroke and focusing on my cadence and my riding. And through the years, I've gotten better um, at riding the rollers. But they are very hard. Um, and But it's something that you should take some time and you know, do some research and try them out. And they're not very expensive. And, and work on your um, cadence and some other stuff. Also, um, getting lights. And it goes, kind of goes back to the mountain biking and the cross bike. Get lights on, get outside, and do some commuting. Um, I have some athletes that I really encourage that live in a little bit warmer climates, um, Carolina area and stuff like that, and I have them uh, commuting to work. And I really, really, even if it's five miles here and there, I really think it's a, I think it's a great idea, um, as long as you have a shower at your work. <laughs> um, you know, we, there's a lot of talk about spinning classes and to spin or not to spin, and I'll give you my opinion on it. And remember, this is just my opinion. Um, I am not a huge fan of spin classes. They absolutely serve a purpose when you're traveling, when you're on a cruise, when you're in a situation where you don't have access to your real bike. Absolutely, uh, spin classes are fine. But if you have your real bike and you're going to the gym and you're doing spin classes um, by choice, really try hard to possibly look at some computrainer trainer classes or, or get on, find some workouts, um, you know, that where you can get specific work done on your specific bike. That's the reason I don't love the spin classes. Not only are you on a flywheel, but you're, that the momentum is really hard to stop on that. But it's also, the spin classes are usually really hard, meaning too hard too soon. A lot of intervals, a lot of stuff in January that we don't really need to be doing at this time of the year when we're racing a big race in like June or July. Um, and so I don't love the spin classes. So it's a nice change of pace. Sometimes I, if I can tell my athletes are getting into a little bit of a, of a doldrum, 
I'll throw them in, you know, go go do a spin class. Take your take your friend and go do a spin class. But in general, they're they're not my they're not my favorite. Um, I talked a little bit already about the virtual racing on your home compu trainer. Um, skate skiing and cross country skiing. I am a huge fan, and this is also in the we can talk about when we get to the run. But I am a huge fan um, of cross country skiing. In fact. I probably work with the, you know, no, no, seven or so athletes that train for the Berkey every year, and the Berkey is a big cross-country race, um, cross-country ski race, different levels and different distances, and it is, it's a phenomenal thing. And most of the Minnesota, Wisconsin, actually Illinois, until we've had this, these last couple of warm weathers, um, and and the Dakotas, a lot of those athletes are cross-country skiing, and it is, it's a great, great transfer to cycling. A lot of people think it's a nice transfer to, to running, and it kind of is, but I really like to transfer to biking. Um, I like the snowshoeing a little bit better for the running that we'll talk about later. So get some cross-country skis, rent them, get out, and get it outside and, and do some of those. It, it's actually really, really, really fun and really hard. Plus, if you have kids, it's a great family uh, thing, as most of you, most of you are aware. Um, so I'm just a big big fan. The other thing too is I already talked about the fixed gear cycling. Fixed gear cycling falls under the same category as mountain biking and cross biking. Um, it's a fixed gear bike. So in other words, you can't shift. Um, I wish I had a fixed gear bike, but I have some athletes that have them and I have friends that have them. And it's a great strength workout. Think about if you're going, you know, and you're out riding in, in mountains and you're out riding in, in different terrains and you can't shift. It really makes you focus on um, generating speed and power and spinning when you, you know, and, and just really is a nice mix of cadence, um, which is important at this time of the year. Um, and, and lastly, indoor time trial racing. It's back to kind of the compu trainer. There are multiple time trial races indoors at different locations. I know we have a lot here in the Chicago area. Something to check out with your local bike shops. Um, but we have races and we race against each other. There's actually cash prizes and it's categorized, meaning you race in Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, or um, if you're not experienced and you're new to it, you can race Cat 4 or as a, as a new, you know, newbie triathlete. Um, but it's a, it's a great way and a lot of, it, they're actually, there's one next weekend. So they're actually at this time of the year kind of to break up the monotony of being by ourselves. Um, so it's something really fun. Um, the other thing too is um, make sure you use a fan when you're doing all these indoor bike riding. This is a, a minor issue, but something that you know your body's already working really hard enough. Keep it cool and um, use use a fan when you're doing your indoor when you're doing your indoor bike races or bike workouts. And when you go to all these races and all these classes, they'll always have um, train, fans on. They should. Here's an example that you'll see on, on your computer of a sample trainer workout. I just put this up here. This is very similar. Uh, you know, as a coach, our job is to make sure that we are teaching our athletes how to ride in all terrains, ride from big ring to small ring to, you know, everything else, different cadences and all that other stuff. So when I write my workouts, and a lot of us coaches write workouts, we write workouts that are similar to the one that you're seeing there, where you're doing some drill work in the beginning, um, but you also have structure. Here is a workout, boom, boom, you know exactly what you're doing, and it's not one that says just get on your bike and ride. And if you can avoid just going down into your basement every single day, if you're, you know, um, if you're just cycling, or if you're a triathlete, three or four times a day that you, or oh, a day, three or four times a week that you go down into your basement and you ride the train and you just get on and spin. Sure, it, it's better than nothing, absolutely. But you really should have purpose and have specifics. And so I, I offer this workout as a very specific trainer workout um, of something to do on your trainer that accomplishes big ring, working on your strength, on 100 RPMs, working on efficiency. And let, let me talk about that for a quick second because I do have a lot of athletes at this time of the year say to me, well, Jen, I can't, I can't spin at 100 RPMs. And my feedback to them is you have to teach your body how to spin at a higher cadence before you can push the power in the big ring. So in other words, 
I remember years and years ago, I worked with Spencer Smith, um, who is a past pro, uh, pro, professional triathlete, uh, retired now, and he coached me for a couple years. And that was one of the things he fixed really fast with me. He said, Jen, you are your cadence is like 85 or you know 84. He's like, that's great and dandy, and probably you can do that all day, but we're really going to work on your cadence so that you can get stronger when you get out in the summertime and you're pushing a big ring. So we worked a lot on all my recovery, all my spinning done at 100 RPM in the small ring. The other thing, too, in the winter, I don't spend a lot of time or have my athletes spend a lot of time in the big ring unless it's specific in, in this workout, as you'll see from three lines from the bottom where it says big ring you know, strength. Okay, perfect. Otherwise, so what happened over the course of riding and starting to become more efficient in 100 RPMs, as soon as I got outside and as soon as I had to push a more normal cadence, 85, 90, I was, I was actually a better spinner. I was able to recover in between surging outside and up and down hills, and I was able to push more power. And I really credit it to that off-season, that one winter where I spent so much time at 100 RPMs. When I first started doing it, my heart rate was so high, I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm going, I'm going to die. And then after a while, it, it became obviously uh, natural. And now it's, it's a no-brainer for me. This was years ago. But this was, it's a no-brainer for me. So something to think about over your winter. Really work on smoothing out your cadence and getting your cadence up there. Um, let's move to the uh, run. I think that's next in, in the um, – in the slideshow presentation. Um, you know, the run is a really fun topic to talk about in the winter because I'm very hardcore with the running. I think that all running should be done outside, um, and, I, and I mean almost all of it. Um, however, I, am, I do understand the limitations that we have, um, whether you're at home and you have children and you need to, you know, you have a specific amount of time and you have to get on the treadmill. Um, I have 10-year-old twins, and when the twins were little, we bought a treadmill for that purpose because I, I couldn't go outside. I had the twins. Um, so I have the, tr the treadmill. And the, some of the benefits of the treadmill is it's safe. It's time efficient. You can lock in a pace, what I call lock and load. You can lock in 10-minute pace and run that 10-minute pace. You can have your – back to what I said on the bike. You can have your full nutrition there. And you also work on faster cadence. You can work on turnover on the treadmill, which when we get outside and we're running outside in the cold and dark and it's 10 degrees, we tend to shuffle a lot more. Um, and that is something that I try to, you know, pull the athletes out of that, that winter shuffle that we get into. Some of the limitations with the treadmill is there's no resistance out in, on the treadmill. There's no air. There's no, you know, wind, there's nothing. So that, that's a little bit of a limitation. Uh, obviously, you have your fan on with the treadmill, too. Um, and it's a lot of repetitive mo motion, so it puts a lot of strain on our lower legs. So you have to be really careful if you have any niggles in your Achilles, in your, par in your uh, plantar, in your calves, and you need to stretch a lot when you get off the treadmill. And it's, so it's one of the limitations of the treadmill. Other than that, I think it's a, it's a great tool. Um, I do recommend doing your short, more intense uh, running on the treadmill and keep your long easy aerobic outside and in lieu of some of your aerobic long runs outside you can do some of the things I've listed here um, back to the cross-country skiing you can do that you can do show, snowshoe racing and snowshoe running there's a whole series up in the I'm sure, I know that there there is in Colorado where Melissa is um, I know that there's some in Wisconsin um, we have some here too as well as trail racing um, and running here. Um, so a lot of that, you can do just a lot of your aerobic stuff. Turn off your garments. Don't get too obsessed about your pace. Of course, it's going to be slower, um, like really slow. And just go for strength. I, the first time I put sh snowshoes on years ago, I could barely lift my legs after I went running. And I was smart. I went out and did like a 30-minute run because I thought, well, if I go out and run an hour in this, I won't be able to walk. And I was so sore. And I'm one of those athletes, I am never sore, no matter what I do. Um, and I was so sore, I couldn't move my hip flexors to save my life. And I thought, and that's when the light bulb went on, saying, this is exactly what we need to be doing in the wintertime. 
to mix up the monotony of going and running 45 minutes easy on the treadmill when I can just slap on snowshoes and go out and run for 45 minutes plus I'm having fun. I'm in the nature, I'm outside, I'm getting fresh air. So a lot of that is really fun. Some of the other things that you might not have thought about that's really kind of fun and different um, that I encourage too is um, – it's kind of funny because people laugh at me. Ice skating. I don't think ice skating takes a place of running, but if you've ever ice skated and ice skated, not with like toddlers and trying to take toddlers ice skating, but put on your ice skates on and actually skating, um, it's actually really hard. Um, and it's a little bit like cross country skiing, but it's a great cross training opportunity. So if you have one, get out there and do some ice skating and you'll, you'll, you'll see your glutes will be killing you. Um, another thing too, another couple things on here that I really encourage in the winter time is yak tracks. And I think I might have spelled yak wrong, but anyway, yak tracks are those. If you don't know what they are, they are those coil. Um, oh gosh, like overlays that go underneath your running shoes. And I put them um, underneath my trail running shoes, and I run, obviously, outside in them on the trails on the snow, and they grip. And they're fantastic. We actually wear them on a very regular basis in Chicago because we always have that that um, that ice and snow layer in Chicago um, on the roads. And it's pretty slick here, and especially if we're running at 5 a.m. and stuff. So we have yak tracks on. And it doesn't really change too much of your gait or your running. It just takes a little bit of time to get used to it. And then you're actually – it's actually wonderful. They're, they're, they grip and they're – they're very, they're just, they're great. Um, and then indoor triathlons, something that kind of goes on with the whole thing. A lot of areas um, have indoor triathlons. And as long as you don't have any knee problems because of that tight indoor track, sometimes they do the run on the indoor track. Otherwise, I think indoor triathlons to mix it up are, are really, are really kind of fun and, and different. So that's with the run. Let's move on to the swim, which I think I could do a whole webinar on just swimming alone in the winter. But let me say a couple things about swimming. I think swimming in general – oh, sorry, Melissa put up the sample workout here um, that I gave. This is a sample workout that I gave. Uh, Melissa, do you want to go back to that sample workout that I had up there for a second? Um, I have a sample workout if she can go back to that. Maybe she can't. Um, all right, we'll come back if she if she puts it if she puts oh there she goes. Thank you. We had a we had a technical glitch, which is why she's manning the things. There's a sample workout for your treadmill right there, if you can see it. And this is what I mean by having some specifics, where you have um, an incline, two percent that represents the incline, and you're and you have specific whether or not you run at this in pace, heart rate zones, whatever. But it's very specific, and it's something that instead of getting on the treadmill and going for a 45-minute run, really mix it up. Challenge yourself. You can see that there's some hills in there. There's a little bit of intensity with two minutes at 0%, um, which is zone three, which is a tempo effort. So there's, there's a little bit of some, um, some juice in there to keep, to keep you know, people from going crazy. Okay, now we're moving to the swimming. And swimming is one of those things where – I I understand why people are concerned about swimming in the winter time. It's one of the things I get the most complaints about, um, and I really I kind of understand why. But I kind of grew up as a swimmer, so I want to say to people: wake up every day, be excited to swim, and and just say I love to swim and go to the swimming pool and swim. Um, I know it's cold, I know it sucks, but you know just do it. And I'm a huge believer in a lot of swimming over the winter time. If you were to ask me what of the three sports should you be doing the most of, unless you grew up as a swimmer probably, and you're a phenomenal swimmer, spend a lot of time in the pool. Because this is a time of the year that you can absolutely refine your stroke, work on slowing down, work on drills, hire somebody to help you in the pool. If you have somebody local, great. If not, find somebody online, send them a video, of you swimming and fix the things that need to be fixed on your stroke. I spend so much of my time, um, so much of my time at this time of the year looking at swim videos and helping people swim. It's just so important. Um, the other thing too is if you have a local master's group, join it. 
I know that there's a lot of discussion. Should I join the master's group? Should I not? Oh, my gosh, I'm intimidated. I am afraid to go. Um, you know, they swim in all the different strokes and everything. You know what? The best swimmers can swim and will swim at the master's, and, if, and you'll learn so much if you do it. Plus, you'll have fun. You know, like I have master's practice tonight, 7.30 to 9. Doesn't that sound awful? Oh, gosh, it, it does. But I absolutely look forward to it because it's just a social for me. Um, yes, it's a lot of hard work. I'm in the pool till after 9 o'clock at night. Um, but I absolutely love it. And one of the things I, I try to do with my folks is, you know, give them a monthly challenge. Give them a weekly challenge. Um, one of the things that happens is, we get so stagnant with our swimming. I got to go to the pool, swim another hundred, swim another two hundred. And a couple of years ago, I got really kind of not not bored, but stagnant with the swimming. And I thought, how am I going to fix this for myself? And then how am I going to fix it for my higher end swimmers, meaning the, the really good swimmers, the swimmers that are coming out in the top of their age group in their triathlons? Um, because giving them this, you know, three thousand yards, five thousand yards. Every couple of days is great, but you've got to mix it up every so often. And what I found was really spending some time learning all the different strokes. I know all the different strokes, but I had never com swam them competitively in like a master swim meet. And I do master swim meets on a regular basis, and I encourage all swimmers to do that. Um, but I decided to swim the 400 IM and the 200 fly. And some of those things were, I thought, I'm going to totally embarrass myself. Um, and I swam them, and I swear to you that my swimming was so much better that year just because I spent so many hours in the pool, not only doing freestyle and swimming the, the necessary yards in freestyle, but then spending all that time and all that strength for fly and I am. And I am is the four strokes, fly, back, breast, free. And I, I, I think it translates over to open water and open water results tremendously. There's so much strength and power in in swimming fly and uh, that is one thing because a lot of triathletes will say to me I don't want to learn how to flip turn Jen I don't want to do breaststroke and I say to them I don't expect you to spend an hour in the pool doing all of that but incorporate it into your program and if you have a master's group that does that don't shy away from it join it do it and challenge yourself um, some of the other things on here, too, I talked about USMS, that's the United States Masters Swimming Group. Is, uh, that is what that acronym stands for, if you didn't know. Um, I talked about the swim meets. I'm a huge fan, even if you think you're going to be the slowest. When we do the swim meets here in Illinois, there it's all age-based. So there are 80-year-olds swimming. Um, and trust me, you won't, you know, you won't be last. Um, the postal swim is just another challenge that I throw out at swimmers, especially swimmers that are chomping at the bit in the winter. That is how far you can swim in an hour straight, and you have to have a witness there, and then you turn your results into the United States Masters group, and they kind of keep track, and then they rank you. It's very competitive. It's very fun, um, and there are some really fun big numbers, 5,000 yards, and, you know, it's, it's just something fun, something different. And the other thing, too, which I kind of threw in there, which I, I – had an athlete do a couple months ago, and he was he was so sore for days. And I thought, you know what? That's a great cross training for swimming. Is rock climbing? Not only is it hard because you're lifting your body weight up through the rock climbing, and this is done at the gym. I don't mean go out and start, you know, climbing your your rocks in your in your backyard, but go to the gyms and use this for cross training. And it is so mentally really hard. And especially some of you that have fears of, of heights, it's a great way to overcome, um, overcome those fears. So on the next screen, there is a swim workout that is a specific swim workout that I was giving that I kind of explained to you guys for bike and run. Um, same thing, where you're warming up, pull with paddles, just in case I'm not quite sure who's listening, if there are some beginners, the pull with paddles, the pull is the pull boy. It's the floaty inflatable thing that goes between your legs. And the paddles are my favorite tool because they are purely for strength. And that is you put on, on your hands, and it's kind of like having dinner plates on your hands. As long as they're not too big and you don't have any shoulder problems, you can use paddles for strength and a lot of front and quadrant work. I do it a ton personally, and I give it to my athletes. And it is actually 
really a great tool to have in the winter. So something to consider to add to your repertoire if you don't have it for this winter. But anyway, this is just an example workout of some, some things. I'm sure many of you who are listening um, have seen workouts like this, but it's just something I wanted to wanted to provide everybody doing some drills, doing some hard work, doing some IM stuff, some stroke work, and um, and other stuff. All right, let's move to strength. Um, and I'll just touch briefly on strength because I want to leave some time for some questions at the end. But the, the strength, I'm going to say the, the biggest takeaway from strength in the winter is this is the best time of the year to hire a performance trainer, personal trainer, as long as they're qualified, or, you know, uh, physical therapist, to evaluate any biomechanical issues that you think you have or that you don't even know you have. I will say if you are a recurring injury athlete, meaning you your plantar is always bothering you, your Achilles is always bothering you, your glutes always bothering you, that is really not normal. Okay, now it's okay in the winter to feel creaky. It's okay, I think, Grand, great grandmaster athletes, athletes 50 plus to all, kind of have things that niggle all the time. But if you are under the age of 50 and you've got something that is niggling every single day, something's not right. You need to have that addressed. And I will guarantee you that it is a biomechanical a strength issue. And um, I'm just a, this is the biggest thing for me. And, I, and this is the, when I talk to all the athletes that I have or anybody asked me, the number one important thing to do in the winter is strength. And there's a lot of varieties going on right now. Um, if it was up to me and money was no object, I'd have you guys all work with one-on-one -on -one with trainers. Because if a really good trainer can correct your form, can address the specific issues that you need to be addressed, and frankly, most of us triathletes don't fire our glutes enough. We have poor, uh, weak adductors. Um, we have tight lower legs, calves, um, so there's a lot of common, uh, common threads with a lot of us triathletes that really can be addressed by a really good strength trainer. Um, so if money was no object, that's what I would have you do. But because money doesn't grow on trees, some of the things that I, I really like is, you know, I like yoga. Is it strength? Yes and no. I guess it depends on who you ask. From my perspective, as a pure triathlon coach, I like yoga just from a flexibility standpoint. Most people don't have the time to do it, but there's nothing wrong with it. So if you can add it to your, your, your schedule, if you're already doing it, then great. I like Pilates. I've taken Pilates before. I find Pilates a little bit boring. Um, I find TRX much more fun and actually much more challenging than a Pilates. Um, that's not a, no offense to the Pilates people. It's a great... Um, it's a great cross training. It's a great strength program. But I really like the TRX. The TRX is, if anybody's not familiar with it, they're like nylon kind of ropes with handles at the bottom. And they're for weight, your weight bearing exercises. So we can put our feet into them and do planks. Um, the only um, hesitation I have with TRX is I have been, when I travel across the country and I jump into TRX classes, I'm shocked at how bad everyone's form is. Um, and so, and I think the instructors, really, you need to be careful with picking your instructor. So either do it one-on-one -on -one or a small group or do a class where, where the instructor is absolutely buttoned up on how to do form. Because there's a lot of people that don't have the core strength and they're doing full, you know, planks for two minutes and they're, and they're sway back and they've got, you know, in other words, use good form. Uh, but I am a big fan of TRX. Um, I talked about the one-on-one -on -one trainer. The gym classes, good and bad. I have a lot of people that do body pump or that do stuff like that. And I think at this time of the year, as long as it is, you know, you're not in there doing, you know, deadlifts of 200 pounds, I think that gym classes serve a good purpose. I think they're social. I think they're fun. And as long as you're getting in some core and some basic strengths, I think that, you know, they, they serve a purpose in the winter. Um, one of the things that's really important to talk about, I think, briefly, is CrossFit. Um, and I probably have, with the people listening, a mixed um, opinion on CrossFit. And CrossFit is just more of an aggressive form of strength training with a lot of mixed, um, you know, lifts and a lot of mixed running and sprints and stuff like that in there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I, I'm not a huge fan for CrossFit for triathletes, and I'll tell you why. I think CrossFit 
individually, you know, as a company, is a phenomenal business, a phenomenal company, serves a niche. For the triathletes who always are tight, have biomechanical issues, um, can't touch their toes, you know, their glutes are always not firing, their IT bands are always hurt, CrossFit's not for triathletes because of that. It's just a little bit too aggressive for for the triathletes. And what happens is I can't get people to recover after CrossFit. So they may have a great CrossFit class on a Monday night, but then they're they're trashed for almost 48 hours. And when we're trashed that long after a strength session, um, it's too hard unless it's a well, it's a brand new, you know, obviously we haven't done strength in six months, then we might be sore for 48 hours. But on a regular basis, you need to be able to recover sooner because we're doing so many different things every day as we try to prepare for these triathlons. So that's that's the reason. I look at it from an injury issue, um, and that's my concern with the CrossFit. Um, so I encourage my athletes not to do CrossFit and to do other classes that might be a little bit safer. Um, so anyway, Melissa, that is, and everybody that's listening, that is in general the, the, the presentation. Uh, hopefully everybody learned something. I offered some you know, different options for indoor training and also, of course, the swimming, the biking, and the running, and the strength, and honestly, the mental part of it, and spending some time thinking about mentally how to stay sharp in the wintertime. And so I'll turn it over to Melissa to see if we have any uh, questions. Uh, thanks, Jen. Yeah, and I apologize about the facts in the middle of your presentation. Um, <laughs> yeah, no that doesn't normally, doesn't normally happen, but luckily it only happened once. Um, so we do have a good list of questions here for you. Um, the first one is, is you talked about yak tracks. So is there any difference in your running form when you're wearing them? Is there anything to, to keep in mind if you're doing a lot of miles on yak tracks? That's a good question. You know what? Not that I noticed. I, my running form doesn't really change much, much when I use yak tracks. I think that we plant, we hit the ground a little bit differently because of the coils that are underneath our feet. So from that perspective, yes, we hit the ground a little bit differently. But as long as you're stable um, and when you hit the ground and nothing hurts, I don't, I don't think so. You can do a lot of your miles with the Actrex. We did a lot of our miles last year. I would say just like anything else, just make sure that you ease into it. Do 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you know, do something like that and ease into it. But I don't think you need to need to change too much of anything with the yak tracks. Okay. Um, is there anything different with a long ride inside doing it on a trainer versus doing it outside? So a three-hour long ride outside, is that the same as a three-hour ride on the trainer? <laughs> you know, that is a hot question. I should have I should have addressed that before. It's a great question. People ask all the time. I, I have to say that time, to me time is time. So I don't say to my athlete, Oh, well, you're, you know, you're, you've got a two hour in, you have a two hour ride. I want you to go outside and let's say it's raining and they may email me back and say, well, I, I can't ride outside. It's raining. I'm going to go on my trainer. I won't say as the coach, all right, cut that ride short. So to me, time is time. Um, now time is time from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, if, if you are tired, if you are over the edge or on the edge, then yes the trainer is much more mentally ta taxing than being outside. So from a mental uh, standpoint, I think it's harder. From a physical, it, it's, you know, you never get a break. There's no coasting, all of that, that you read about and that you hear about. But to me, I have to say, time is time, inside or outside. All right. Um, so um, going back to the mental aspect of training in the winter, do you have any tips or any um, hints on how to stay motivated if your A race isn't until July of this summer? Yes. You know, it, it, yes, I do. I think you have to do a couple things. One, you have to have a really good, whether you write your own program or you have somebody writing your program, that program has to fluctuate between, you know, keeping things fun and keeping the workload reasonable without burning you out. So one of the things that we have to do as coaches is to make sure that you guys are having fun and that you don't come to us February 1st in tears and you're already burnt out. So you have to have variety with your, with your program. And that's 
hopefully some of the things you learned today, just take a couple things away from today to kind of break up that thing. Um, also, one of the things I, and don't laugh, and I can't see you guys all laughing, so I'll just go ahead and say this because it's always fun when you can't see people. But, you know, one of the things I always do when my alarm goes off in the morning, I actually am a morning person, but if you're not a morning person and your alarm goes off, this is what I, <laughs> this is what I do. The first thing that enters my mind if I have a workout to do and it's five degrees in Chicago and I can hear the wind blowing is I think to myself, if I don't want to get out of bed, I go, Jen, what is your competition doing? You can bet, bet my bottom. They are not laying in bed deciding if they're going to go out and work out or not. Um, so I look at it from a competition standpoint. I know that my competition is sitting on the beach in Hawaii and in, in, in swimming in open water in January. So I look at it from a competition standpoint. If you're not in triathlon for the competition part of it, then look at it from being a better triathlon, better triathlete and go back to my thing of the champions are made in the winter. The number one thing you can, the best thing you can do this winter is be consistent. If you can string together week after week after week of really consistent workouts, um, following your plan that you're on, then you can absolutely see benefit, see change for for in the spring, whether you're an experienced triathlete or a new triathlete. So it's hard, but you, you have to mix it up and you have to be mentally um, mentally really sharp. And Jen, we're not laughing at you here. That's actually, in all my years of swimming, um, my coaches would tell us that exact same thing. If you don't yep. get up and do your morning swim, what's your competition doing? They're getting up and they're doing their morning swim. Exactly, and Melissa, because you grew up as a swimmer, and I grew up as a swimmer and a runner. So for me, the whole concept, the whole concept goes back to my coaches yelling at me growing up going, you know, and this is before we had to be politically correct, right? Now coaches with kids have to be politically correct. Trust me, they weren't politically cor correct 30 years ago with me yelling at me saying, I bet you so-and-so, whoever it was at that, that year I was swimming, is not, you know, sitting in the bleachers crying that she can't swim the 100 fly or whatever. So, yeah, a lot of us, and I carry that mentality, too, as an adult athlete and as an adult coach. You have your goals. You've given me your goals. I can only drive your train to these goals. And you guys listening, you guys have goals. Write down your goals. You have three goals for this year. Write them down in an index card and put them somewhere that you have to see every day. And you have to answer to yourself. I mean, of course, you know, um, crap happens and, and things happen and things come up. But in general, 95% of the things you guys should be able to get done if you plan appropriately and just, just don't make excuses. Don't, 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 allow the, don't allow excuses. You know, get control of your own, of your, of your goals and, and own them. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. Do you have any preference of trainers over rollers? Yes, I would say if, if if you had to pick one, I would get the trainer. The only reason I say that it's just more versatile. That's all. It's more versatile. You can the trainer. You can do a lot more with the trainer. I find it takes a long time to be able to learn how to stand up on rollers on your bike, and do a lot of of complicated workouts on the rollers. So the rollers. I like for recovery, working on cadence, working on form. So if you have to pick between rollers and trainers, get a trainer. All right. And then the last one is um, regarding running on the treadmill. Um, some people say that it's best to run on an incline. If you run on 0%, it doesn't necessarily um, mimic running outside. So what's your take on that? My take after doing some research on it, and this is, this is you know, this is all kind of, some of this is kind of new, actually. I, my, the recent research that I have read is that unless you're running faster than a 730 mile, the incline on the treadmill doesn't matter. Meaning, what I mean by that is the zero to the 1%. Because you know how most people say, always run at 1% on the treadmill. And I have to be honest, I, that's what I run personally at 1%. But they say that unless you're running at a faster than a 730 mile, then that incline, the 1% or zero, doesn't really matter. So what I tell my folks is in general run at 1%. And if that feels too hard and you're kind of struggling with that, then, then start at zero, keep it at zero, and fluctuate um, your warm-ups and cool-downs between zero and 0.5 and, um, or one 
and, and, and kind of keep it in that range. I have mine set at 1% because I've been doing it for so long that this was before, this was back in the day when we all said you have to run at 1%, 1%, that's all that, you know, that's what simulates being outside. Recent research is showing that, like I said, 7.30 or faster is 1% is okay. Anything slower than 7.30, it, the, the results are, are, are not concrete right now for the benefit of that. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, it does, definitely. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions. Jen, thank you so much for doing the webinar. Um, I want to mention that Jen also does um, podcasts. So she just posted a new one. Is it on your website yet? It's not. I can't put it on my website. It's right now it's on Facebook and Twitter. Um, okay. But I can put it on my website. I did one to, last night on pregnancy. So if anybody's listening, all things pregnant. Um, very, you know, how to get pregnant, not how to get pregnant, but you know what I mean. The difficulties of getting pregnant as a female athlete, um, pregnancy, and then post-pregnancy and how to get back. Um, so it's very relevant if you're in that phase of your life. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot that, that goes along with that whole topic. Um, so I encourage everyone to check those out. And we are recording this, so we're going to get it up on YouTube and probably have the link out to everybody tomorrow. And with that, I want to thank everyone for taking the time and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Good luck.